You see, he mentions a lot about my friends in California are doing this right now. So I'm his friend in California that this is, this runs is AI companies. Guy. This is a guy. Damn, this is amazing. We're, we're walking around asking people what okay. they would do with an extra thousand dollars a month. Oh, yeah. I'm not a good person to ask that question. <laughs> Why? Uh, what you got? What's up? You on the phone? Okay. Oh, Andrew Yang. That's what's up. That's what we're gonna talk about. No. Oh, okay. Let me get chat. Right. Uh, hey, can I call you back in a minute? This is what's up. Okay, I'll talk to you later. Bye. Okay. What's up? What's your name? What's your name? Bon. Bon. I'm Cliff. Bon. Nice to meet Cliff, you. Cliff. Nice to meet you. Okay. So, yeah. So before we even ask, you recognize Andrew Yang? Yeah. Okay. So you know about Andrew Yang? Yeah, we're friends. You're friends with Andrew? Yeah, I started chatting with him, uh, like, when he first started running. Like, we have a running text thread. We've, like, had one-on-one -on -one several times. Wow. Yeah, I went to Brown, um, and so I got to know through there. What's your name? Oh, Pete. Pete, I'm Cliff. Nice to meet you, man. This is awesome. This is awesome right now. Yeah, we're, we're walking around asking people what okay. they would do with an extra thousand dollars a month. Oh, yeah. I'm not a good person to ask that question. <laughs> Why? Uh... I run a startup company that does pretty well, uh -huh. uh, and so I am very fortunate to be in a situation where I, like money is not the, the thing that is going to impact a big change in my life, uh -huh. uh, but I think that uh, economics where we don't start at zero, is, uh, sorry, capitalism where we don't start at zero is a very, very good system. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Damn. Cliff? Wow. So were you like in Venture for America? Or did I was not in Venture for America. Um, I started running uh, companies when I was in high school. Uh -huh. So I built like 40 different products like payment systems, apps, websites, um, like health supplements uh -huh. when I was in college. Um, when I'm super dyslexic, so it's really hard for me to read. Uh -huh. um, and I built a tool called Speechify. Yeah. And it lets you highlight any text in your computer, scan physical books, take PDFs, and have them read out to you with an artificial intelligence voice. So it uh -huh. helps a lot of kids with like dyslexia, AD, anxiety. Uh, it's used by like several million people who read like hundreds of millions of like words with it a week. Um, so that's the company that I spend most of my time running. Um, when I saw that Andrew, when I read the article in the New York Times, I was like, damn, this guy's awesome. Uh -huh. There's great uh, principles on this website. Uh -huh. um, let me reach out. So I okay. reached out to him and like basically chatted what, how, how could I help promote everything that he's doing? And yeah. then did a bunch of work with him to try and do that. Damn. Um, not in any official capacity, just like uh -huh. I'm good with Facebook. I'm good with Instagram. I have like a good network. and so. Okay. So you you both went to Brown, but you, you Brown. didn't know each other. Uh, I think I saw him speak maybe once or twice. Okay. Um, was he once, a student then? He, no, he's not. Okay. I'm, so I'm he's like, oh. 25. He's okay. like uh, I don't know, 40, 45, 44 right now. Uh, 44. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead here. Uh, yeah, I saw him speak once at Brown. He was very kind, very sweet. I uh, uh -huh. gave a lot of time to all the students. This is when he was running Venture for America. Okay. Uh, I met him once another time where I did like a venture uh, project in New York, yeah. and we went to the Venture for America office, I think. And but I yeah I didn't do venture for America because in my time not in school in my time in school I was like I studied renewable energy engineering as my major and I was running companies full, like outside of that and then when I wasn't in school I was just doing the company stuff full time yeah. and then when I graduated I just stayed at Brown as a visiting scholar um, and what I did to create a minimal uh, UBI for myself I went and I taught computer science at a company in the Bay Area called Make School made me enough money to support myself for like the 10 months or nine months of the year when I was working on companies. Yeah. And then I was like, cool, I'm just gonna keep doing this until I can build a company that is successful enough and then that's what happened. Uh, but it was because I had the financial ability to support myself during that time. And I also did a lot of other like, uh, I basically applied to a ton of scholarships, which is how I eliminated my debt for college. Uh, yeah. come from, I come from, I immigrated to the US um, and became a citizen five years ago. Yeah. Um, and so my family didn't have like that much means when we first moved here. But uh, yeah. I created essentially a UBI for myself and it allowed me to, me to start my company. And so that's great. Most people are not in my situation, but um, I think that the system that Andrew has for how he intends to fund UBI is really, really brilliant. And so if you look at how he explains it, basically there's a lot of disorganization in how the United States government, um, both in the federal and the state level, uh, does um, aid. Um, this is uh, social security, entitlement, disability. So Andrew's book, The War on Normal People, um, or regular people. It's really, really good. Highly recommend reading it. Uh, but he goes into a lot of details there. And uh, in my opinion, government ends up becoming very, very bloated. I am an entrepreneur and I very much support having like protection of your rights and uh, a government that doesn't get in the way. But 
that uh, has the minimum amount of regulation that is positive. And so I think that the way in which we do support now is not effective. Um, I think that if you just cleaned all that up, removed it, and then replaced it with 1K a month, it works really, really well. I think the other thing that I'm surprised Andrew hasn't talked about more is entitlements is like one of the most pressing issues that currently exist with our government, and it's set up in a way where it can never get solved. Like, there's never going to be a time where the older generation is going to be like, you know what, younger people, it's fine. You don't need to pay for our retirement. Like, it's not going to happen. But with UBI, you can get out of it. It's the only way that I've ever come across that allows us to get out from under entitlements. And entitlements actually like are getting worse and worse and worse because people are living for longer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, so to answer your question, if I was not in my current situation, yeah, I would use it in order to easily relocate. I would use it to find additional education. I think for all the other people in the world who might not be in a situation as fortunate as me, it makes a lot of sense to give people the space to be able to educate themselves, to be able to move from like one state to another. I think that's critically important and vastly under um, emphasized. I think that it gives a lot of empowerment, especially for, for women and people who come from places that have a little bit less education. Um, and I think that overall, it's a much cleaner system that is more fair, both for people who are from lower socioeconomic status, but even more so for people who come from a wealthier background. Yeah. Damn, you're awesome, man. Uh, you guys are awesome. You're doing the work. I'm just sitting yeah. on the grass. Like, no, there are, we've been talking to some people and then, you know, there are arguments from both sides where one side says, you know what, that would just make people lazy. Yeah, I can address and that. And then the other one is, you know what, that's not enough. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, so like, where, where do you... Okay, cool. Um, tell me your name one more time. My name is Bon. Bon and? Bon and Pete, okay. Yeah. So, Bon. Um, okay, there's two arguments that you're describing. One is people will be too lazy. The other one is 1K is not enough. Let me address the 1K is not enough because that's actually the one that I disagree with more. I think the lazy one has merits, but I also think that it is uninformed. So, 1K is not enough. Bullshit. Um, when I graduated college and I decided to start working on my own thing, I was like lowest burn possible. So I went and I found an apartment in Providence, Rhode Island. It cost me $450 per month in rent. Okay, that's about half the amount that I spend. I spent another maybe $200 on food. Um, I did not have health insurance, um, which ideally you would, but it's fine, I could deal with it. Um, and I had enough money left over for like other miscellaneous costs. Here's the thing. I did not have kids, I was not pregnant, I was not paying a mortgage, um, and those things make things very, very difficult. One thing that people very much do not understand, so uh, my point is, you can get a lot done with just 1K, plus you have literally all the rest of your time to go make money. Like, go work on Upwork, um, and or, or go work for like Amazon, Tur like Mechanical Turk, and like circle like things to help AI. Like do whatever, I can also go deeply into AI, obviously. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do. So 1K is, is enough. Um, minus healthcare, I, yeah. that's difficult. Um, number two is people being lazy. So, ha, um, so I'm Jewish, so I don't eat on Yom Kippur. Um, it is so difficult to get work done if you're hungry. It's impossible. Like I challenge anyone who says people will be lazy to not eat for three days, and sleep outside, and not shower, and have people not talk to you, and not have an iPhone or a MacBook and then tell me they're late. No, it's not that you're lazy. It's impossible to get any work done if you're in that situation. So to help people out of it, you give them a baseline, um, which I think makes the most sense and ends up rejuvenating the economy much more, not to mention the multiplier effect of having that money spent. So I think that people being lazy is like a very obvious argument, but I think it's a very, very um, myopic view of the situation. Um, that doesn't take into account what it's actually like to be in a disadvantaged background. And if you are someone that's giving that argument, um, if you grew up with literally no resources and no one paid for your college and you like worked your way through high school and your parents were not educated and your siblings did not help you out, then you have a leg to stand on and okay, way to go, make that argument. Um, it's harder for me to argue from that perspective, but if you did, you can make it. I'm not saying don't, you have the right to make it, but go don't eat and sleep outside for five days and then still make that argument. Yeah. So like, did you did you know? Are you familiar with UBI before, before Andrew? Met? No, I didn't. I was not. No? Okay. And then how did he? Did he have to sell you really hard, or were you like you just okay? You get it. So, I um, I read a lot. Um, I'm super dyslexic, so I grew up like not being able to read at all. I would fall asleep inside of Harry Potter every single day, and the librarian would wake me up. Yeah. Um, and so I did really poorly in school when I was young, and then. 
Uh, later, my dad would come and he'd like finish work early. He'd come and he'd read Harry Potter to me. And then he recorded that on a cassette tape and I'd listen to that over and over again. And I got to know the story really well. And then before I moved to the US, before I speak it, spoke English, my dad found an audiobook of Harry Potter. Yeah. And he was like, if I buy this for you in English, will you listen to it? And I was like, yes. He's like, are you sure? He's like, yes. He's like, okay. So I listened to that 22 times in a row. That's how I learned English. And then I became obsessed with audiobooks. So I, even though I'm dyslexic, read about 100 books a year, usually like two books a week. And I've done that for the past like 13 years. I learned a lot about the world and like built my own like philosophical view of like how the world works. Yeah. Um, coming into school at Brown, I uh, was very uh, fiscally conservative, um, but there's been wonderful moments where my viewpoints has shift. Uh, my viewpoints have shifted. One of them is I had a roommate in con college, Connor, and he showed me this amazing video about wealth distribution in the world. And it showed how much a health fund manager makes compared to a teacher. And I was like, yeah, that doesn't make economic sense, actually. And what happens is I have this, uh, I'm really obsessed with this idea of creating value. There's an incredible essay by Emerson called On Wealth, where he talks about this. I think that a high school teacher makes more value than a hedge fund manager. And what happens is, um, a few hedge fund managers create a tremendous amount of value because they unlock resources from companies that are misusing those resources. They can be used better elsewhere, but you have a very long tail of people who make a lot of money and they're actually not needed. I'd rather that resource go elsewhere. So that was an example of me shifting my mind and thinking more, okay, we should like find a way to edit the economy so that this mismanagement of capital does not happen was and that incentives. The, was, that the, was that the point that Andrew was making? No, uh, no, not, this is unrelated to Andrew, but this okay. is an example of my viewpoint shifting. Okay. And then, Four years later, uh, I read the article about Andrew. I sent him a message. He met up with me. We chatted for coffee. We met up again. And then I organized all my best friends who are really smart. And I was like, all right, all my best friends, here's Andrew and his team. And we just worked for three hours to figure out, okay, how can we like, promote this the most that we can? And so he introduced the idea of UBI for me in the first meeting. And then I downloaded his book and I read it. And I thought, you know what? This is very, very smart. It's very smart because it cleans up the way in which we do entitlements right now. Um, it's very smart because the fact that I had the money from Make School to pursue my own projects and have the freedom not to take a job was critical for where I am right now. I would not be where I am if I still had to work a full-time job and app. And like there was a period where I was like that, but like I was sleeping three hours a night and I would like do a nine to five jobs, then I'd go home, I'd freelance as an iOS developer from like 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., go on a run, have dinner, and then from midnight to three in the morning I'd apply scholarships and then I'd wake up in the morning. Um, and that was like not a sustainable way to live. And I had the benefit of like having enough education where I knew how to do this in like an efficient way because I learned how to be a good writer, I learned how to use technology, etc. Um, I could work in a job that was like paying me enough money. So I did not know about UBI before Andrew. I talked to Andrew and the idea just made sense. And so that's when I was like, okay, this, this does make sense. Um, and it's very interesting when uh, in, I'm only visiting LA right now. I, Where are you based? I'm based in Palo Alto, but more and more I ended up, I ended up spending like two weeks in New York, two weeks in London, two weeks in LA, two weeks in the Bay Area. Um, I just was in Providence not long ago. I'm flying to Montana this weekend to give a talk at a school about dyslexia and learning disabilities. But when I'm here, I always talk to Uber drivers. Um, and so I just got out of a really interesting talk with an Uber driver who drove me for like 50 minutes who loves Trump. And he was extremely knowledgeable. He emigrated to the United States from Germany. He is on his green card right now. He listens to a lot of uh, very conservative uh, podcasts. Um, and he gave me very good data about the government of California and how it's mismanaging its resources and how it's terrible that there's the homelessness problems here. And I completely agree with him. Um, and we talked about Andrew Yang. And he thought he gave me the laziness argument. And I was like, well, it's not correct for like the following reasons. Yeah. And I think that if we manage to clean up a lot of the inefficiencies, that works. So um, in computer science, there's a concept where if you build a method, a program, and it has bugs, and it's not working, the best thing to do is delete it and rewrite everything from scratch. You don't know what could have been wrong. Right now, we have a very messed up program. We should just delete it and rewrite everything from scratch, and the less there is the better. So, if you now compare this, if you want to look at a conservative point of view, I'm obsessed with Alexander Hamilton. I've read his biography like three, like four times. I have every single word of the musical memorized. Uh, I read all the Federalist papers and the bi like 40-hour biographies, like Washington. Ever. The reason why the Constitution is so good is because it's simple. There's not a lot of sentences. All the sentences are short syntax, and that is not the way in which the U.S. entitlements, tax code, everything is written right now. Andrew Yang, Andrew Yang's proposition is: let's take all that and make it as simple as possible. This is the most constitutionally savvy and like founding father-esque approach to modern politics and legislation that I've ever seen proposed. Yeah. So if you're conservative, that's the thing to consider. So he, he, he mentions a lot about, my friends in California are doing this right now. So I'm his friend in California that is, runs AI companies. Who's the guy? 
Damn, this is amazing. You think, uh, you know, he says, like, uh, we're going to surprise a lot of people and that most Americans are not paying attention right now. To his campaign? Yeah. Okay. You think we're going to blow up? I mean, we already have. We already have. Um, the mainstream media the, says otherwise. I mean, no. Right? Like, look at him in the ratings. It's incredible. Um, there's a very good um, study that was done. Uh, looking at all the data of all the people who have won elections uh, for U.S. presidents in the past like 50 years, and it's very demonstrable that people who win elections often are extreme underdogs. Donald Trump is included in this list, um, and so are many, 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 many other people. Like um, this morning, I went to Gold's Gym because I'm trying to meet Arnold Schwarzenegger. Arnold Schwarzenegger also became governor of California and was like totally like a non-contestant. But if you look at the rate of growth of Andrew Yang, I, I think it's the highest of any candidate right now running. Um, and here's the thing, it makes sense. Uh, I think that a lot of the other people who are on the Democratic ballot um, underestimate how hard the Trump voters have it. Uh, and Andrew gets it. And if you look at the video of him uh, driving with a truck driver who in the end decides to become an Andrew Yang supporter, like that's exactly it, Like he talks to people. Now, here's the other thing I like about Andrew. I was obsessed with this problem about trucking being the number one job in the majority of states in the United States. And I know because the, the number one company that makes AI for trucks is run by one of my best friends. Like I 100% know exactly who is doing this, how it's going to get, who is funding them, and when they're going to roll out. Um, and it's incredible technology and it will replace most truck drivers in the United States. At the same time, uh, as a hobby. I volunteer in prisons teaching um, felons or people in prison how to get a job after uh, prison. And so I work with this foundation called the Macheri Foundation. And what uh, Matt Macheri, who runs this foundation, discovered is that the best job to get after you're in prison is to become a truck driver. Because it's one of the only jobs that does not have a criminal background check. So what Matt and I did is we took Speechify and we made, uh, we took the uh, course, the, the booklet that you need to read to become a truck driver and digitized it. Because most people in prisons, 20% have dyslexia um, and many don't have good education. So they can just listen to it and a lot of them use that to become truck drivers. Um, and I'm worried that less and less of them will be able to become truck drivers because that job is going away. Anyway, um, then Andrew Yang goes, hey, there's a big problem with AI in this category. And I'm like, yes, exactly. Now, if you also look at the way in which the tra trajectory of the world economy is going, um, many of the most important jobs right now did not exist five years ago. Like if you look and you talk to kids who are in preschool, the number one job that kids want to be, if you ask them, is not firefighter, it's not policeman, it's I want to be a YouTuber. And you guys know this because you're taking a video of me right now. Um, and I know this because I monetize my YouTube channel, uh, Cliff Weitzman. Um, like and subscribe. Um, and so, like that job didn't exist before. Facebook, Instagram marketer didn't exist before. Um, it was not a thing. So my brother made, started making iPhone apps when he was in eighth grade and he was ranking like the to top 10 social networking category of the app store in like 100 countries and made enough money to pay for Stanford when he was a 14 year old. Like app developer did not exist as a job. So there will be many, many more jobs that will get created, um, but they'll be less based on manual labor and more based on creative output. Uh, and often in order to be able to do good creative output, you need to pick up some skills. So one of the best ways to pick up those skills is a website called monthly.co. It's run by Valentin Perez and Max Deutsch. Uh, and they teach you how to do a bunch of awesome things like that. So that's more Andrew Yang friends um, who are, are brought to that meeting with Andrew. So um, yeah, uh, I'm really, really scared because those people who voted for Trump in the past election are the people who just like, their jobs are going away. Um, and most of those promises were not upheld. Trump has done some actually great things. I really dislike him because I can't deal with bullies. Um, uh, but some of his policies have been great. Um, but those people who we said he would help are not really getting helped. Um, but they are getting helped with the policies that Andrew is suggesting. It's not a perfect system, but it's the best one I've seen. Um, and I welcome counters. They just need to make sense. Yeah. The, the new statistic just came out that 80% of Andrew Yang supporter would definitely vote for him and t about 20% said they would change his mind. Are you in that 80%? I would not definitely vote for Andrew Yang. 
Um, I think that he makes perfect sense. Um, I am biased because I personally know him, so yes, I would vote for him because like it would be dope to have him in the White House. Um, so I personally know him, so I can attest that the man is a good person. Like he's a good person, um, and I think every every appearance that he does, you can see it. By the way, one of my main concerns is he doesn't smile enough during the debates, um, and he's sometimes funny and he's killer funny when he's funny, um, but his personality is not showing enough. I wish that that came out more. Um, so, um, yeah, I will almost certainly vote for him because I can personally attest to him being a great person. Um, but if you don't know him, um, I think his policies make perfect sense. Um, but I'm an open-minded person. I change my mind depending on the information that I absorb. Um, so far, no one has given me information that makes me more excited to vote for them than Andrew Yang. The only reason not to vote for Andrew Yang is if you think that your vote will not count. Here's the thing. You're voting initially in the Democratic uh, primary, not in the full election. So. Yeah, he's the one who I think, if put up against Trump, will have the highest chance of winning. If you look at data, it also demonstrates that he has the highest chance of winning because he's the one who has the ability to sway the most Trump supporters to his side. Um, so yes, I will vote for him in the Democratic primary for sure. Um, and then in the overall election, I highly doubt that Trump is going to suggest policies that I support more than Andrew Yang's. Um, and uh, I have experience knowing that Andrew Yang holds his word and that Trump does not hold his word. So uh, that's my, my view on that. Uh, yeah. That's Andrew Yang. I've seen the first time I saw him was Joe Rogan. Okay. Okay. And then it, oh, I went. So you started following from Joe Rogan. Yeah, it was like in uh, beginning of August. Okay. Not from like February. Okay. Right. And then ever since Joe Rogan is like went back to the rabbit hole. I went through the rabbit hole, and then we we get to learn the real Andrew through the podcast, right? Not the debates. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Andrew's the man, man. Just test. And then. And he's got balls. Like he's running for president. Go him. Yeah. And he's doing it like. He had to stop running his company. He has to like stop a lot of things to like concentrate on this thing. It's because like he wants to do good for the world. Yeah. What are the chances that we're walking around here and then we meet Cliff, who's like an actual friend of Andrew? He's one of those California tech guy, right? I mean, it's also the case that you tried to interview me and I told you no because I was on the phone. Yeah. But I saw the hat. Now, how cool is it? that literally his campaign is math. Come on. This is amazing. And it's not someone who's like trying to get elected by like rallying up um, hatred and dissent, um, which has been used for years as a way to like get elected. But no, he's like, this makes sense. I promote education yeah. and I follow education. Um, and I'm gonna do things in the way that makes sense. And to me, it makes sense. Um, and most importantly um, is like for people who are suffering, and who are in the situation where they are like homeless or can barely pay their rent or don't have health insurance or trying to get their kids to school. Like, it's amazing that Andrew Yang is running on the campaign that he is because that is the most direct way that you can help people. Um, if people give you studies that UBI did not work in other places, um, those are cherry picked studies that um, are. Finland. Then, exactly. They're cherry picked studies that are also spun in a negative light um, and they don't show you the other studies. Um, and if you just look at the actual data, it's clear, it's very, very positive. Um, but also, if you ask questions, it makes sense. So yeah, good chances. Nice meeting you guys. Andrew Yang can win. Andrew Yang can definitely win. I think of all the people running from the Democratic side, the person most likely to win is Andrew Yang, uh, because he is the one that is most likely to get Trump supporters to switch to his camp, especially ones that follow Trump promises, saw that they didn't come to fruition for them. Um, they got less coverage from healthcare, they got less support, they got less jobs. Um, now, Trump has created a lot of great jobs, but in a very short-sighted manner, in a way that in the long term will hurt the economy. Um, he's obsessed with ratings, um, and so what he's doing is manipulating numbers in order to make himself look good. Um, if he was running a startup company and I was an investor, I'd be like, I can see you're fudging numbers here, like you're manipulating the economy. Um, and he's not addressing long-term problems. Uh, he's a good businessman, uh, good, good, uh, like, selfish policies that uh, in the long term, I don't know how uh, positive they are. But yeah, Andrew Yang can definitely win. I think he can uh, sway more Trump supporters than any other person running on a Democratic ballot. Uh, I think he's also just like a good guy. So like one of the roles as president is to be the first citizen. That's the first citizen I want to get behind. Wow. You know what? Cliff, thank you for talking to us. Thank you. This is an amazing moment. The Yang gang is real. We are not just internet bot trolls, okay? We're out here on the ground. And we're going to spread it far and wide. Nice to see you guys. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. Where, where can people find you? Okay. 
uh, you can, all right, YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. So uh, YouTube, search Cliff Weitzman, C-L-I-F-F-W-E-I-T-Z-M-A-N. Uh, Instagram as well, Cliff Weitzman. Uh, Facebook as well, Cliff Weitzman. Um, I do a lot of talks on entrepreneurship and like how to <laughs> solve student loans for yourself, how to start companies, how to teach yourself how to code, um, how to like develop your own like value systems. Also on Medium, if you just search Cliff Weitzman Medium. Uh, I also have a lot of stuff on how to get ripped um, and how to listen to audiobooks. And if you want to read really fast and not have to like slave away in school, you should check out Speechify, Speech and then IFY, and search it on the App Store uh, for iPhone, Android, or Mac, or Chrome. That's him. That's Cliff.